So in the words of Alan Shepard on the launch pad in 1961, Dear Lord, don't let me screw this up. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt, and I'm an economist. So I'm going to talk to you guys about imperfect information on physical activity and caloric intake. And question one is, why is this economics? It's not the stock market. It's not the unemployment. It's not guns and butter. Well, economics is a study of resource allocation. And insofar as that's true, economics is first and foremost a study of choices that people make. And like all social sciences, we need some axiom that governs how we think individuals make choices. Ours is very simple. People maximize their happiness subject to their constraint. We all want to do what makes us happiest, just depends on our limitation. But so that we have kind of a starting point for thinking about happiness and constraint, we impose some strong assumptions on the kinds of preferences that people have. One is transitivity. We're not going to talk about that. All you need to know is college football is not transitive. And two, as we assume that people's preferences are complete, meaning that they know for every alternative in the set what they prefer to something else. Now, implicit in that is an assumption of complete information, okay? But sometimes we observe people making choices <laughs> that kind of boggles the mind. How is this rational? You know, are, are people really doing what makes themselves best off, or are they some way limited by information? Or do they face other constraints? Or do they have odd preferences? Now, one occupation. One application of this, unfortunately, for me at least, relates to body weight. Since the 1960s, we've seen obesity rates in our country rise consistently. And this is becoming an increasingly public problem as healthcare provision becomes a public enterprise. Individuals who may be acting with complete or incomplete information, but who we think are optimizing, they're becoming social costs to the actions they take and to the decisions they make. So if we want to think about how we get people to change their behaviors, there's kind of two routes, right? You can either give people incentives, you can pay them, which can be very expensive. Or if we do think people have incomplete information, then perhaps information treatments can kind of nudge people towards making better decisions. But with respect to body weight, you can say, well, Harris, there's a lot of information out there, right? I mean, you know, you walk into McDee's and you see this, but there's problems with this information, and that it's actually very imprecise. So with respect to the Big Mac meal, there's a 600 calorie spread in terms of what actually happens when you raise your hand and order one of those things. Even if you get the combo meal, there's still a 240 calorie spread. Now that may not seem like a whole lot, but when you combine that with the fact there's actually heterogeneity between individuals in terms of our caloric needs, specifically your caloric need and your caloric need and my caloric need are totally different and ain't none of them 2,000 calories. But a quarter pack of M&Ms per day will lead you to five pounds per weight gain per year if not corrected by some other sort of compensating behavior. So when we talk about can information be effective, we think about the necessary conditions for information treatments to work with respect to body weight. One is people have to estimate their caloric in needs or their net caloric balance with error. And two is that that net caloric balance misinformation has to be related to the decisions that people make with respect to food. Otherwise, they really are doing what makes them happiest, and we have to pay them to change that. So if we consider two alternative versions of the Shrek-looking dude up here, um, one of whom accurately perceives his physical activity, uh, the other one overestimates his activity, which one of these guys is going to eat more? And that's what we're going to try to get to in our empirical study. So the data for our study come from the CDC. Um, and what the CDC did was they interviewed people, asked them about their diet, their lifestyle, their habits, all that kind of stuff. And then they said, here, step into this van. Uh, we're going to weigh you, and we're going to ask you about everything that you ate in the last 24 hours. Last but not least, we're going to slap an activity monitor on you and let you go cruise around for seven days, ask you to send it back in the mail so we can see how much you really move around. So what we have is actual and reported physical activity, actual and reported body weight. We only have reported nutrition. Uh, we're not that concerned about that. Everything we know from survey, from the psych literature, and from econometrics says that where results are biased downward, not upward. So in some cases, that's not a big deal for us. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this measures of food intake that we have and regress it on individuals' actual activity, misreported activity, and a whole bunch of other stuff for control variables. And we're going to restrict the sample on the basis of accuracy and reported body weight. And the big idea is if people are telling the truth about their body weight, why would they lie about the determinants of that? And if they're not lying, it's incomplete information. So we find that people who overestimate their exercise intake more calories, sugar, and carbohydrates, but that this misperception of physical activity is not linked to other, any other things, not related to sodium, caffeine, alcohol, smoking, protein, fat, you name it. 
And in terms of the magnitudes of these effects, the, the estimates that we find are big enough to matter. So we find that individuals who overestimate their exercise by one standard deviation are going to intake about an additional 40 calories per day. 65% of that is junk. And if people don't realize this, if they fail to update their priors, if they fail to feel their pants getting snug, that's going to lead to an additional four pounds of weight gain over the course of the year. It's also interesting for among whom are these results most concentrated. So we find that the results are concentrated among individuals who are most likely to have information imperfections. Less educated people and people with fundamentally noisier patterns in their exercise behavior, and also among individuals who we would like to see benefit the most from information treatments. Uh, people who are small exercisers and or big eaters. We also may be concerned though that some omitted variables are driving our analysis, but we find that including other consumption of health bads doesn't affect our results. Neither does our, 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 our central variable have anything to do with consumption of over health bads. It's all quite locally related to uh, excess consumption of, of carbs, sugar, and calories. So what we find from our study is that if information treatment is going to be effective, it needs to be personalized, it needs to be precise, because even with very small margins of error and in information about needs, that can lead to big consequences over the long haul if not corrected. Now just because it can be successful doesn't mean it will be successful. So if we consider a guy like me who looks in the mirror, if I see Arnold Schwarzenegger, that's called self-delusion. <laughs> and if you're that kind of person, then if I, if I get a text message at 1145 that says, Harris, you've been still since eight, avoid fries. I may be inclined to ignore that, okay? But so what we're dying to know is, is because an information treatment like that can be effective, is it effective? So we'd like to set up and be able to run a field experiment. We're trying to figure out how to do that. And last but not least, today is my birthday. And I think with my standing up here, I've probably burned enough calories to have a piece of cake, right? All right. Thank you.